Marty, can you hear me? I can, yes. Good. All right. Uh, let me know if you can hear Brad and Corey. Can you hear us? Good morning, Marty. Good morning. You're coming through. Okay, cool. Good Thank deal. you, Marty. Thanks. Now, it looks like you guys are trying to use a camera, but all I see is a black screen. I'm sorry, say it again, Marty. I, it looks like y'all are trying to use a camera, but I just see a black screen right now. Uh, we don't have a camera in, on this. We're in the OPC conference room. Gotcha. It's been a long time since I've been in this conference room. Hey, everybody, we are still waiting for uh, participants to log on. Uh, looks like we've got uh, Marty from DE, uh, Jeff and Lorreen from Ameren. Uh, is there anybody else on that can identify themselves? Yeah, Dr. Mark, this is Jeff Cable with the uh, commission staff. Hi, Jeff. Thanks. Oh, we got some more people. Looks like Bellman just joined from Spire and Brian File from Evergy. All right, we will plan on starting here shortly. We'll just give it a few more minutes. James Owen has shown up. Hi, everybody. Okay, we will give it a couple more minutes. We'll start at uh, 10 05 uh, just to allow people to come in. Do we have anybody from Liberty Utilities present? Okay.
And we had a question from Diana Carter asking us how to unmute. Uh, I think you just click on the microphone icon uh, if you would like to speak. Looks like we've got representatives from all the utilities and state agencies now. Yeah. Nate, can you hear us? Loud and clear. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, good morning uh, for the MEAC Missouri Energy Efficiency. What's the A stand for? Advisory. Advisory, Advisory. Council. Advisory Council Statewide Collaborative. I think this is our fourth um, one of these. Uh, no, it's, it's several. Or several, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, looks like we've got 16 participants online. If we could go around and do um, introductions, uh, I'll start off. Uh, my name is Jeff Mark, I'm the Chief Economist with Missouri Office of Public Council. And in our conference room, I also have with me Greg Fortson with Commission Staff and Corey Boston with Commission Staff. Uh, we've already heard from uh, Jeff Keevil, uh, Council with uh, Missouri Public Service Commission. If we could go around, I'm just going to, if uh, representatives from DE could identify themselves. Morning, everyone. This is Marty Hyman, Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Division of Energy. Thanks, Marty. Anybody else from DE planning on showing up today? Um, I'm not sure. You might get uh, Jordan, but not sure. Okay. Well, we'll we're happy to have you. Uh, anybody from uh, Renew Missouri? Hi, uh, Jeff. This is James Owen. I'm the executive director of Renew Missouri. I believe um, Philip is my other colleague here. Philip. Well, we can see Philip's name there. Philip, when you get a chance, just unmute and introduce yourself. Sounds like he's very deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. I Let's think uh, Andrew might be joining, uh, but he's got a energy efficiency for all call. That's got a standing call at 10 a.m. So I think he might be coming later. Okay. Hey, all can right. you hear me now? Hello. Yes, we can. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, that. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just to remind everybody, we are uh, per uh, commission rules. We are recording this session, and it will be on EFIS uh, at a later date. Uh, let's go with uh, Amarin, Missouri. Uh, who do we have representative from Amarin, Missouri? Hi, this is Lorraine Wallachson. Good morning, Lorraine. Good morning. Hey, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is Jeff Friedrich from Amarin, Missouri. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we may also have Steve Wills coming in and out today. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, from Evergy, Missouri. Hey everybody, it's Brian File. Uh, good to hear from you. Good to see you. Uh, we will also have coming in and out uh, Natalie Dre from the products team, as well as Randy Spala from our evaluation measure and verification. I think I'm the only one on the call at the moment. So looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Uh, from Spire, Missouri. Shailen Dean is on the call, Spire. And I think uh, Bellman from my team is on the call. And I don't know if I'm seeing Lamar on the call yet, but he may be on the call at some point as well. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Uh, from Liberty Utilities. Uh, Nate Hackney, Senior Analyst uh, over Energy Efficiency. Um, joining me today might be, I know uh, Kim Dragu, my manager, is uh, traveling for business and uh, has intermittent accessibility. Uh, she may end up on today at some point. I also just forwarded the invite. I'm not sure if um, our brand new um, PM, uh, Greg Holm, I just forwarded the invite to him. I'm not certain if he was on the distribution list. If he wasn't, that's totally fine again because he's he's been with our team for uh, about three weeks now. Um, so he may, he may pop on today because I did just forward him the invite. Oh, and also uh, Ryan Thompson looks like is out there. Hey, Ryan, introduce yourself. Hello, I am Ryan Thompson um, with uh, the regulatory department at Liberty. 
All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks, Nate. Uh, we have uh, several other uh, actors that have joined. Um, we'll go right on down the line. I'm gonna. Is, is there an Annabella on? Uh, hi, yeah, that's me. Um, I'm with the Andel Policy Group. Uh, I'm sorry, with what group? Andel Policy Group. Okay. And uh, hey, hey, Jeff, sorry to interrupt. I think Diana Carter is the call in user and she may have been on mute. I just got an email from her. Oh, excellent. Welcome aboard, Diana Carter. Uh, let's see. Uh, Randy Spale. Uh, yes, here with Evergy. Yeah. Good morning. Eamon V manager. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Samarth, you want to introduce yourself? Well, Smarth is with uh, yeah. with Mia uh, Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Yeah, sorry about that. I think I was I think I was double muted. Are you able to hear me? Uh, we can hear you now. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Summers Medicare with the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Sorry. Yeah, excellent. And uh, looks like we have a representative from Recurve. Yes. Hi. Good morning. This is uh, Shauna Gavora. I'm a policy analyst with Recurve Analytics. Excellent. Thanks for joining us, Shanika. All right, well, we appreciate everybody's patience uh, with getting our statewide collaborative off uh, off the ground. Uh, we had a couple of restarts due to some some conflicts and scheduling. Uh, so we realized, you know, this was a relatively last minute reschedule uh, for, for Tuesday morning here. But it's no doubt a very important topic that we plan on uh, discussing here. And that's uh, uh, to discuss in more detail um, pays uh, or pays you save financing on bill tariff. Uh, and potential next steps. Uh, as many people on this call are, are familiar with, we had a, uh, the month of May was, was jam-packed with Rocky Mountain Institute um, e-accelerator meetings uh, discussing this topic uh, that culminated in, in a final presentation and has led to uh, this discussion that we're actually having this morning. To put this in perspective with the other energy efficiency programs that are in place right now, um, as Brad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we've got uh, extensions effectively with each one of our investor-owned utilities through the rest of this year and 2023, and um, which aligns everybody up for um, portfolio programs um, and applications for the uh, calendar year 2024 moving forward. Uh, so uh, everybody's effectively aligned, you know, at the moment in terms of timing, which also presents a unique situation from uh, a filing standpoint. So, you know, we're, we're, I would say that we're on, you know, knock on wood, we're on pretty good grounds right here in terms of, um, you know, collaborative discussions and, and hopefully we can maintain that that momentum. Uh, I know Spire Missouri is in for a rate case, but uh, at least speaking for myself, I don't anticipate energy efficiency being much of an issue in, in that rate case. Uh, so those programs should be, you know, I, I would assume stable, you know, moving forward. Um, I had asked each of the utilities, if they would, to go ahead and present um, a little bit about their experiences to date uh, with their PACE program. Uh, and then as sort of a precursor to open up discussions as we lead it into uh, the larger presentation about uh, uh, pace moving forward. So without further ado, uh, Lorreen, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and select you first with, with Amber in Missouri. If, if you're prepared to go ahead and uh, do a presentation. Yes, just give me one second here to get that open because not as familiar with with the webex right webex so but i see the link so the, the button so it should work just one second here yeah uh for for those that are getting ready to present uh following the rain uh it, it's a square button with an arrow um that allows the share content mm -hmm. here we go okay. yeah, we, we, we can see okay. it great uh, so, first, let me give a little disclaimer. Uh, Maureen Wellickson, I'm Senior Consultant, Energy Efficiency Evaluation and Strategy. 
So I help manage our evaluation of the program. So my focus is going to be on our PY21 results. If you have any specific questions on you know, how things are going in PY22, I won't be able to answer that. Jeff Berg would be the right person for that. He is on vacation coming back tomorrow. So you know, if there's any questions related to that, I will write them down and ask Jeff tomorrow and get answers back to you. Okay. Um, so some results, high participation summary of results from PY21. So you can see here, you know, we started with a thousand people interested and they go through each of the tiers. And so you see the level of participation drops from one tier to the next, with the end result being there were 66 customers that completed tier three projects in 2021 which was 6% of the people who had originally expressed interest in, in the program. That caused us some concern. We wanted to know why so many people were dropping out before completing a tier three project. So a big part of our evaluation focus was on those customers because it was only the first year of the program and because pays wasn't in the original evaluation budget we did have a pretty limited evaluation in 21. We didn't really do much of any impact evaluation. It was focused on process and a big part of it was why are people dropping out? So a summary of what kind of people are participating. These again are those 66 people that completed tier three projects. Uh, you can see the majority were electric heating customers. That makes sense for 21. We were focused on all electric customers. We didn't have code delivery. We didn't have the all fuels rule. So you see a heavy emphasis on all electric customers. That that was our, you know, our our target market was the electric customer. Uh, you can see almost everyone was an owner, just one renter. And then there's a little bit of information on copay. So 30% of the participants did not require a copay. 46 had a copay. Um, so, of, of the ones that were required to have a copay, the average was about $2,900. Uh, so, we did, you know, I, I said there wasn't much impact evaluation. We, you know, basically opinion dynamics used the deemed values from utility as the results. But you can see here, you know, the electric savings were. We achieved 15% of the, the, the target on energy savings, only 4% on demand savings. And the financing goal, we only reached 7% of that. So we were pretty far below our, our goals for 2021. So Opinion Dynamics identified these barriers to participation in the tier three. Um, so they, they surveyed 12 people, so it's a, it's a pretty small survey, but, you know, 12 of, well, uh, of what, uh, about a thousand. So, you know, it, it was a small survey. Uh, we, we, you know, are, are going to have a much broader evaluation in 22, both impact and process, including a lot more surveys. Uh, so you can see seven people thought the energy savings were, you know, relative to cost what was a burden. So basically cost was too high. Uh, that that also overall cost the project. So I, I would lump those two together. The cost to the energy savings wasn't sufficient for those customers. Three people didn't like the copay. Um, and two didn't like the length. Uh, the length can go up to 12 years. We cap it at 12 years. The interest rate for most of 21 was 4%, so one person didn't like that, and then one other. And it does say people could identify multiple barriers, so, so that may not add up to 12, doesn't, but there were 12 people surveyed. Uh, Opinion Dynamics also asked people if they completed projects outside of PAYS. And here you can see four people said they completed all of the recommended projects outside of the PACE program. Three completed some, and then two had planned to complete. 
So that that's kind of interesting that, you know, that people are either, are they finding better prices? Do they not like the financing terms, but that some of them are moving ahead with projects outside of pays. Opinion Dynamics gave us quite a few recommendations for improvement. Uh, the first one was minimizing co-pays through precise customer targeting and or moving forward with plans to incorporate gas measures. Uh, well, we, we've done that in 22 with adding co-delivery. Um, they said we should need to manage the expectations. So apparently, you know, the, the issue with people having a copay, they, they weren't expecting that. So we need to make sure our marketing materials explain the program a little better so people know they might have to pay a copay. Uh, they suggested that we do some tracking on the reasons why customers are abandoning their projects before you know completing them in the tier three. Consider target marketing among renter and landlord populations. You saw you know only one person was a renter, everybody else owned their home. And also consider adding multifamily residences. I, I know that's something that came up in uh, the RMI discussions. And follow up with people who receive an easy plan, but, but don't move on to tier three to see if they want to install measures without financing through our other programs. So some of these measures, particularly the HVAC measures we do offer through other programs. So if people don't want the financing, they could get the measure in another program. We did make some changes to pays either in late 21 or in 22. So the interest rate was reduced from 4% to 3%. We launched co-delivery with both Spire and Ameren Missouri Gas. And we now follow an all fuels rule. So I've included the language from the tariff there. Uh, so basically in 21, you know, we, we were, we could only count the savings from the electric savings in the in determining the copay and seeing if the project even even passed the 80 20 rule where um, the well the 80 percent rule where um, savings have to cover 80 percent of the cost and anything a cost above 80 percent is paid in that copay um, so we, we've added all fuels so now gas and propane can be included in that calculation so hopefully these three changes will lead to, you know, a lot more projects in 22 and, um, you know, higher, uh, higher amounts financed through the program. Um, if you want to read our evaluation reports, they're all avail available on EFIS. I put the docket number there for anybody who doesn't have that. And um, there, there's a lot more details there on what the impact was of the program, the energy and demand savings, and also a lot more information on the demographics of the people who participated. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, I've actually got a question to start you off. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going back, I think it's slide number two or three. It's, it's got a breakdown of the numbers. That one? Yeah. So of the 1,048 that enrolled, um, do you have a sense of how many of those that enrolled um, were not able to move on to tier one because they didn't, the savings just weren't there? So I think moving on to tier one, that, that's before we would even figure out those savings. Okay. That would be the people who. So would that be half of them? Yeah. Yeah, half of them don't even move on to tier one. So, um, so tier one visual inspection and receipt of direct installs. Um, let, let me check with Jeff Berg on that. I don't know if that means they never actually scheduled an appointment. They expressed interest and didn't schedule the appointment. Or if there was some follow up they needed after the tier one. So let me verify that and get back to you on that. But okay. um, so the, the tier two is the people actually had the full home assessment. And that's where you would determine if those 80%. Right. So, as you go from the 350 down to the 66, I think is probably what you were asking about. Although, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why people dropped out there. But if you, if you want information on 
you know, did customers not meet the 80% or what those co-pays were? I can get, I can have Jeff give you some information on that as well. Yeah, just, just a, a better understanding of, you know, if, if, uh, if the enrolled, if the difference between the enrolled and the tier one is just, you know, those customers not, well, I guess start there. I mean, why, what happened to the other 48% there? I mean, how did they fall off? Okay. And I guess we can go from there, but, but thanks. Uh, You're any welcome. other questions for, for Lorraine from, from Amherst, Missouri? Okay. Uh, we, well, appreciate it. Thank you. Now I have to figure out how to get out of this. <laughs> Uh, I believe if you hit the share content button again, um, you oh, should be able to okay. exit out. Marty suggests looking for the stop button at the top of the screen. <laughs> You have somebody could steal it back from me. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could try. Um, I don't know if it lets you. Yeah, if you hit share, it would have been. Ah, there I see. Stop sharing. That should do it. Oh, perfect. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, well, next we're going to have a presentation from Evergy. Brian, uh, are you ready? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Let me uh, see if I can learn a little bit about the sharing technology here and get this shared as well outstanding we, we can right. see it great great okay let me see if i can all right so what i'm presenting here is uh, as part of our stipulation and well i guess it was technically was an order and then a follow-on stipulation uh, we were to file a six month update on our pay as you save uh, pilot. Uh, and again, for everybody that doesn't know me, I'm Brian File. I'm a director in the products group here at Evergy, uh, responsible for both energy efficiency and demand response programs, as well as some other uh, utility customer facing programs and efforts. Uh, but I'll give a little bit of an update here that we gave to stakeholders in April um, as we hit our six month mark. Our official launch, as you see on this slide, was uh, in September of last year. Uh, and so we've been got a few extra months after that. I'll try to add a little bit of color uh, on that update as I go through here. But uh, this is this is the update through April, at least, so you can kind of get a feel for some of the same numbers that, that you saw from Laureen on their uh, experience in the first year. Uh, so we were you know, tasked with providing a a list of different uh, outcomes as a function of uh, the, the order. And uh, so we'll run through all of these, but hit on some of the key drivers that you hear here. So I'll also try to provide a little bit of insights into what we think is opportunities or, or weaknesses as we go forward. I think that was a little bit of the question and answer that you were hearing there from the group that I think helps us all learn. Uh, so participation rates, uh, obviously the easiest visual is the, the bar chart there on the right. It's kind of flipped of how uh, Amron had presented it, where we've got our uh, completed installations at the top and uh, interest form submissions at the bottom. Uh, we do have an extra tier in there from how our, uh, we evaluate the steps for our participation. So you'll notice a little bit of difference there as you walk through um, you know, interest form submissions is what what we get electronically uh, can be can be via phone, but most likely online as people submit their interest. Uh, tier one is when we go through and uh, do an, uh, an assessment, make sure that we can uh, reach them, have a meeting with them and talk about it. What's possible? We do actually do some direct installs at that point. Uh, tier two is a full blown energy audit, you know, evaluating. Uh, the building shell, understanding age of equipment and, and working through all the details there. We call tier three as an easy plan delivered. And so that's where uh, customers 
uh, are eligible and have um, a facility or home that can uh, be offered a pay as you save tariff in the form of an easy plan. And then tier four is they've actually went through and delivered uh, and had all the equipment installed and are now on the tariff. A couple things to note as you look across there, uh, this, this is a point in time, as you might imagine. And so some of the processing that goes from one step to the next isn't always included. And we do see somewhat of a time delay from tier three to tier four, just in getting the easy plan, going through the decision process, ultimately getting everything installed. Uh, so I'll just pause here, and this is gonna be a little, there went a little bit of a theme to the rest of, of the parts, but make a, a general comment. And I think what we saw in our first six months was we did quite a bit of marketing, which we'll have a slide on towards the end. And that really built the pipeline of leads fairly quickly that, uh, Honestly, the, the infrastructure in a six month period of time wasn't fully ready to, to work through all of the um, you know, in-person touches, follow-ups, reports, contractors. Uh, so that, that's been an opportunity for us to continue to kind of build that infrastructure to deal with the throughput that, that uh, we saw in the initial interest forms. So you see a little bit of that also in just the, the drop from the, in this case, it's the bottom part, but we usually call it the top of the funnel as the, the largest uh, piece of the, of the numbers there as people are interested. Uh, so a little bit of the, the details on the right there, or excuse me, on the left, uh, you know, we did target some uh, LMI, low moderate income zip code areas. Um, so we did get some, you know, as a percentage of interest, uh, pretty good interest from that sector as well, which we thought was good. Um, at that point in time, we had a little bit of owner renter um, balance of, uh, we were trying to focus on a little bit of owner renter balance that wasn't really there yet. We had one uh, renter uh, go through the process. I think at now uh, we're somewhere closer to like maybe 5% renters. As a reminder, they obviously have to go through and get owner approval for that. So that's an extra step in the process. Um, uh, there, just at the point in time, we had more projects scheduled for install. Some of the barriers, uh, there's a little bit of asbestos. Um, some of the gas leaks was maybe you know, not necessarily, a, uh, just for clarity, nothing to do with Spire, but uh, just people's internal home systems. They need to make sure everything's tight and ready to, to work through there. Uh, a little bit of mold, um, but we're also trying to make sure we can connect with our Casey Lilac program, which may, most of you are familiar with uh, is our ability at low end low income leadership assistance collaborative, you know, making part of that one touch. Uh, so that's uh, something that we continue to try to work through to make sure that is working smoothly. Um, and then co-pays, and this, this is something that's probably worth talking about and heard a little bit from Laureen. Um, you know, with no co-pays, it makes a lot easier uh, to sell. Uh, as you see, 93%, when there's a co-pay that drops our acceptance rate down and, and has continued to do that. We've continually seen co-pays being a bigger part of the math to make the 80%, 20% uh, rule work. Uh, some of that we think has to do with the cost of equipment in our region and, and the market there that we're trying to see how we can influence, but it definitely has been a trend um, thus far in our experience. A little bit more about per, the projects that had closed through uh, March. Um, we had a little over three hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, loan uh, tariffs, projects financed. Um, average, average project side there size you see there pretty similar across our jurisdictions, uh, and we had a few large projects, a few small, but but that two to five thousand tends to be the the uh, biggest. Uh, weatherization definitely the largest driver of the measures as you see on the right there um, smart thermostat uh, is, tends to be an easier one the hvac measure is one that we tend to struggle with when it starts coming into the copay math uh, as we've experienced in the first uh, six to nine months here as we've gone through so that's an opportunity for us to continue to kind of evaluate when those make the most sense 
Uh, overall satisfaction, uh, generally pretty good uh, across the surveys here that we had through that far. Um, again, once they get the project done, the, the scores go up considerably from 8.2 just at the pre assessment or excuse me, post assessment phase to the post installation phase. Uh, so they're excited to have this uh, making their home more efficient and uh, being able to manage through their bill. Uh, at the point in time, again, at the end of March, we really had this backlog of of homes that we've continued to work through. So that was part of our effort, really pushed to continue to get more feet on the street through the, the e utility implementation team and build out our trade ally network to get the projects completed. Um, we did launch uh, with Spire in April-ish. Um, I'm sure Shailene will talk a little bit more about the, the uh, combined effort that we've gone through, learning a little bit more on kind of which homes are make the most sense and how the math works out on a co-delivery. Uh, as maybe most of you know, we have uh, some arrangements related to what, how we deal with the percentage of savings and that translates to the percentage of the tariff going on each individual utility. Um, not really any insight yet on utility financials. Uh, we have always been at the 3% uh, interest rate uh, per our original stipulation. So that's continued. We haven't had a ton of feedback on that necessarily, but uh, that's something that we can keep from customers, something we can keep an eye on. And then our, our cost effectiveness and, and full evaluation won't be done until um, after this 2022 evaluation period. Just a couple quick things on who's participating and some of the marketing we've done. Again, we had really positive experience in terms of uh, interest right away. Um, and this is a little bit into the what we saw as we saw the demographics of that interest, uh, something to learn from here. Um, you know, generally it's across different income ranges, um, homes being built fairly before 1981. That tended to be a, a, a insight that I thought was valuable for us as we think about home age as, as a uh, driver for potential for retrofits and upgrades. That makes sense, right? But uh, we saw that prove out in the data. Uh, and then, you know, again, household size, these are multiple occupant homes you see there on the top, which uh, tends to drive uh, a lot of energy savings and just the, the fact that there's two folks or more in the home uh, and, and the energy that they can save that way. Uh, and I think that was it for our presentation from then. Open to questions or thoughts uh, from that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah. Any questions for Evergy? Brian, this is Brad with staff. I apologize if you mentioned and I missed it, but um, do you have a sense of what the uh, average copay was for those that uh, needed to uh, pay the copay? Yeah, I don't believe we included that in here. Uh, I'll have to get back with you on that number. Yeah, I, I believe this, and I can confirm the project size is usually just the tariff size, uh, but I've just anecdotally, I've seen, uh, you know, hundreds to thousands as copays uh, of this for various projects. And honestly, I think that's worth uh, digging into a little bit more, just considering, you know, if a customer has, you know, hundreds to thousands ready to to invest, they probably feel better that it's not, you know, 6,000 or 7,000, but it still is a certain type of customer that has those dollars available. Um, so as opposed to someone who who may be truly trying to get you know free cash flow right from day one so it's a little bit of a different uh, participant profile there but i can follow up with you on that perfect thank you brian um with those copay participants are you finding that they're the results of of, of measures that are outside the traditional installation process I wouldn't say so. I, I think what I've seen and, and uh, probably could get some correlated numbers on this is, is effectively once you introduce HVAC, there's a good chance there's going to be a copay depending on what was installed before. Uh, if it's electric strip heat, maybe not. Um, but if it isn't, then likely to be a copay is, is my, again, observational experience thus far. But we could probably get some numbers to support that. 
Okay. Uh, the, the next question I'd have is, um, in your six months that you've had the program in place, have you seen any price shifts in the the overall cost of the measures, particularly on the HVAC side? Know that I have any trends on the on like you know contractor bids for various uh, parts of these measures, as you see on the right here. What what I've just uh, anecdotally heard and and uh, probably the utility has a more data on this is what they see across the different jurisdictions of the state. It can be fairly regional and even sub regional in terms of pricing. Uh, and so they've observed that our market tends to be a little bit higher, which you know, makes an impact on the 80, 20 math for the tariff and the easy plans. Uh, so whether or not, you know, with inflation and other things, maybe you're alluding to, I haven't quite gotten the analysis on that impacting in the last 6 months, but I'm imagining it, it has been at some level. I just don't have any data on it. Fair enough. Thanks. Thanks for the insights, Brian. A any other questions for Brian here? Okay, uh, we'll pass it on, pass the mic on over to Spire, Missouri. Uh, Shannon, uh, you ready for, to present? Yeah, and, and we won't be as in depth as some of the others because, you know, we're, we're still kind of getting off the ground with everything, but let me pull this up for you. We can see it. Okay, let me move some of this stuff out of my way though. All right, so this first slide that I have up is really just the timeline for Spire because this actually took a little bit of time as far as getting pays off the ground. So we, we actually awarded some of the work back in July. So, you know, the contract negotiations actually took us quite a bit of time, um, you know, August through September and maybe even spilled into October a little bit. Then we really jumped into some program discovery and, and onboarding process once we finally got over that hurdle. Uh, the biggest piece there, the whole time we've been doing a lot of different things on the marketing plan side. So Spire has been in talks with uh, Ambrin and Average East since the beginning, even a little bit of talks with Liberty at this point as well. So there's probably more that we could share on the marketing side that I didn't have a chance to throw in here for today uh, because we've been dealing with some other things, but I want to make sure we presented something here. Um, that soft launch and testing, we thought originally that would be about February is when we would soft launch and, and, and be about ready to go. But that really spilled over into April, uh, as I think you heard Brian speak to earlier. So really our, our soft launch and that full launch really started to kick off about mid May to uh, early June is when we started putting out the press releases and things of that nature website, everything live, uh, you know, all the testing on the back end to kind of move this program forward had been done. So we felt good about that full launch. The next slide. This is really just that customer journey that I think you've heard uh, Amron and Evergy both speak to as far as the home visits, the in-depth energy analysis, the easy plan and the direct install. What we're seeing so far, and we'll share some brief numbers for today's conversation. Uh, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing some of the, the tier one, twos, and threes. We we just yet to see, um, you know, a, a direct install at this point, and that's something that we'll probably be talking with both uh, Amron and Evergy about. Our activity looks a lot stronger uh, as far as our, our efforts with the Evergy side, and I think that's due to some of their their marketing efforts. I think um, we're also approaching some things and, and talking with Amron's marketing team. So I think we'll see a lot there soon as well. But most of our numbers, I believe, are more uh, correlate more with our efforts on the west side of the state. So kind of getting into these early numbers for us right now, um, you're seeing a total of 430 enrollments, uh, direct installs 271, uh, 221 assessments. And then easy plans created, we're seeing 140 created. And then 
this other easy plans, we're trying to really understand what our conversations with e utility, uh, what this really means, because we, again, haven't seen any true plans go all the way through yet, because um, we've been waiting to test our system uh, with that financing mechanism and how everything's built in our CCMB. So we haven't got one through um, the full process yet. Uh, we're expecting some. And this kind of leads me to some of the discussions we've been having with e utility. And they're really around um, pays port, understanding that more because we, we pulled this out today. But there's a couple things that we've asked for some additional access on that it doesn't seem like we can get into to really uh, quantify all the numbers. Uh, but it sounds like they'll, they're working on that and hoping to have that resolved today. So we can kind of get into those details more. But this is an early snapshot of, of where we've been, and you'll see that um, around June is when things really start to take off for us for a moment, even though there's been a slight pullback in July so far. But June is when we really start putting out those press releases, a couple of things on social media, our marketing efforts, again, with some of the things we learned from some of the other utilities that had launched prior. And then I just kind of stopped here, Jeff, for, for today, really just to kind of have more of a discussion as far as any questions individuals might have for us. One other thing before I open to those questions, I would say is with Spire, the, the biggest thing for us uh, was really trying to figure out how to work with all our partners in, in different areas, right? Uh, with Evergy, with Amron, um, hoping to work with Liberties here pretty soon as well. And, you know, th there are always challenges there, like on the back end and, and making sure things line up and and really walking through those processes. Um, I think that we've got through a lot of those pieces now. Uh, so we're more focused on e utility and and uh, pushing that relationship for us to, you know, to actually see the results of individuals installing some of the equipment uh, to Brian's point. And I think uh, Lorraine's point earlier, when it comes to the copays, we don't really have those details yet, but we thought once we came into the program, it would help with some of that, uh, since Spire was taking on some of that for the customer as well. Uh, but we're not far enough in our understanding of all the reporting and pays for it to, to really, you know, speak effectively to that yet, because I like to have the numbers first. But that's kind of been our experience so far um, with the program. Thanks, Shailen. I uh, appreciate the insights. Uh, I'll open it up for uh, questions. Any, any questions for Spire Missouri? Okay, um, we're going to pivot now uh, and go to um, <clears throat> presentation over uh, next steps. I mean, what we've been given here, again, this is just speaking for myself, um, sort of a mixed bag of results in, in our first year. Uh, you know, but my first impressions, the, the numbers are a little rough, uh, to, to say the least. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but, you know, if for a program to be scaled up, um, you know, across the state like this, uh, the number of auditors, touch points, um, I'm just going to try to articulate some of the reasons I, I think I heard from the different utilities, uh, health and safety hazard issues, uh, co-pays were, were clearly an issue, uh, and I think, you know, what Shailen did a great job of, of really visualizing for me was, how much of a difference having Spire in this makes this program. Uh, you can see, you know, the, the the touch points and the numbers increase exponentially just by bringing that copay down. Um, one thing that I don't think um, the energy efficiency guys uh, get enough credit for, uh, and I'm, for the utilities here, is you know really just an understanding of the psychological barrier that you know confronts a homeowner. In in saying, well, I want to go ahead and drop you know several thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or seven thousand dollars. This is a lot of money, um, and you know the, the pace program itself is is not the most intuitive thing you know at first blush. So uh, nobody said this was going to be easy. Uh, you know we recognize you know moving forward that you know getting those deep savings you know beyond light bulbs really does require um, a harder sales pitch. And I think that's bearing out with the numbers that we're seeing. Um, you know, 
other things that occurred during this time, you know, not to mention just COVID-19 um, issues with uh, inflation, supply chain constraints, um, but, you know, really a credit to the utilities um, in, in terms of moving forward and, and adapting. Uh, the all fuels rule, uh, co-delivery models, um, you know, even, you know, the easy pay method. So, with that, I'd like to go ahead and move to our next presentation, which is going to be for me. So, hopefully everybody can see this. If I can get a, a confirmation from somebody. Yes, we can. Yeah, All right. Good. Thanks. Hey, hey uh, Jeff, this is, this is Jeff Cable. I'm trying to follow along. Are you following the agenda or are you skipping around? I think I'm skipping around, Jeff. Okay. Are you the uh, speak, outside speaker to be determined? Yes. The outside speaker had to cancel because of the change of update. Okay. So yeah. Filling in for that, for that outside speaker, Jeff. Okay. That's no problem for me. I just was curious. Thanks. Edward Yin from AC Tripoli sends his regards or regrets for not being able to be here. So, uh, the pay statewide model discussion. Um, and queuing, you know, the Beach Boys theme here. Little disclaimer before we talk, uh, before we start, you know, the comments on work product are my own and don't necessarily reflect any position in the Missouri Office of Public Counsel. So, uh, you know, again, just my own high level thoughts. I think it helps to look at this, um, you know, first on a macro level, current state of affairs. Missouri is unique in that uh, we are not a state that has an energy efficiency standard or target, uh, a specific target uh, that, that's tied in Missouri. There are no residential building energy codes or commercial energy codes or appliance efficiency standards. So, you know, right off the bat, um, very unique relative to, to most states in the United States. Uh, at a high level, what what can you draw from that conclusion? Uh, that there should be a lot of potential energy savings within Missouri because uh, the structures themselves aren't having to be built to a certain standard or code or, or typically not enforced at that level. It also helps, you know, where there's been a, a number of discussions about um, co-pays and the overall cost of products uh, and that Quite often, you know, as a pays recipient goes through this process, you know, it, it, it's not cost effective or they fall out for any number of reasons. Uh, that 80 20 rule uh, and that 80 20 rule is important to remember here in that there are a number of different on bill financing tools available. Um, our office, other interveners supported the pays model because it was a very conservative model in, in how those measures are promoted and I say conservative um, if anybody had been following um, you know a lot of the, the headlines that pace you know received over this past year particularly in Missouri that would be you know a handful of bad actors that uh, were very liberal in their energy savings and, and targets so why do I bring all of that up at a macro level moving forward I'm fairly confident that the price of electricity is going to increase now, why do I say that? I'm just going to cite to some filings in Evergy West. We'll look at their five year PISA investment plan comparison year over year. Um, the most recent plan that was filed in 2022 is looking at a almost a 200% increase from its original plan in 2019. That's $2 billion in planned investment. That's not even touching, you know, generation investment. For Metro, over a hundred percent increase in its five-year plan. These are all costs that are going to be borne by ratepayers and effectively going to increase the cost of service. For Liberty Utilities, 
In their 2019 case, their total rate base adjusted test year was one and a half, approximately one and a half billion dollars. Their PISA filed investment capital project plan over the next five years was $2 billion. It's a 138% increase off their existing rate base. For Ameren, Missouri, most recently, they filed IRP. What you hear, have here is a visual of planned uh, generation resource uh, additions and retirements. At the top end of this graph, what you see is uh, various renewables, solar, wind, and in 2031, uh, a 1,200 megawatt uh, gas combined cycle plant. At the bottom, not one, not two, but four base load generation plants uh, of, of capacity being uh, lost over the next eight years. Uh, what's important to note from this is that the, the additional renewables um, are not accredited capacity. So at, at a MISO level, you're getting 50%, 20% of the actual generation accredited to meeting their, their capacity needs. So significantly less. So on one hand, you definitely have a reduction in carbon emissions. On the other hand, there's, I think, reasonably a very big concern as to reliability issues moving forward. But all of this is going to cost a lot of money. So what's the takeaway? Costs are increasing for rate pairs. Storm URI like events, well over $200 million for Empire, uh, $360 million for Evergy West, uh, and reliability concerns overall have increased and are likely going to be more the norm than the exception. Uh, migrating to a more carbon-free future that ensures proper reliability is going to require an increased emphasis on least cost planning. And I'd be remiss if I just didn't hit home the opportunity costs that face each one of the utilities and stakeholders moving forward as we look for just and reasonable rates for rate pairs. There's only a finite amount of money, a finite amount of time. Every decision has a cost, and even the, the, the decision to not make a decision has a cost. Um, stated differently, you know, I've, I've often say that we can probably solve just about any problem. Um, but trying to solve all of the problems is where we end up with a problem, <laughs> having an issue. So challenges with DSM uh, historically, and this is a non-exhaustive list, um, include what are we deferring? Uh, historically, most of our utilities have been very long on capacity. Uh, that dialogue is starting to change and change rapidly. Most rate payers have to pay into the program. The sole exception tend to be uh, industrial customers that are exempt uh, per the statute. But most rate payers do not participate, or at least don't participate at a meaningful level because they do not have disposable capital, which is really the impetus behind uh, our office um, exploring the PACE program. This is especially true for renters and low income households. And consequently, demand side management can become a regressive policy and is often the first on the chopping block when rates get too high. So, first impression of pays and operation. And, you know, again, hats off to each of the utilities for presenting uh, what you did. I, I think gave us a really, really good overview of first impressions. On a positive, I'd like to say that um, within a year span, um, we managed to bring together co-delivery uh, and cost allocation. Again, the utilities were able to, to come to various memorandums of understanding with each other. Uh, we had four out of the five utilities with approved tariffs have program offerings. Uh, the interest rate is now uniform across the board at 3%. And you have program certainty through at least 2023 with opportunity for real cost savings moving forward. The challenges, on the other hand, are deep. Scaling up across the state to meet demand has proven a challenge. Um, and I, I think just being honest, that, that has most definitely been, been a problem in having you know, customers wait in the queue uh, and getting the needed uh, touch points across. 
outside externalities like COVID-19 that, you know, largely out of our control, inflation and supply chain constraints, number of auditors, as I mentioned earlier, and then different incentive models in place across the utilities. Uh, have all proven to be somewhat of a challenge at, at different points. As we move forward, it would help to consider what does the empirical literature say on this so far? Uh, Amherst, Missouri uh, was required to do a market potential study and to look at um, what sort of opportunities exist for pays moving forward. Here's a figure, and again, this is all public information. This is a, a figure of a single family baseline consumption profiles. Um, yet below what you see is, is a breakdown in various segments according to customer fuel type and housing stock. So this varies between, you know, single family. Uh, well, it's all single family homes, but it varies between, you know, good, poor, adequate and, and solid foundation. Um, and then natural gas customers, electric space heating customers, electric furnace customers and uh, heat pumps. Uh, and what you'll note is that the vast majority of Amarin customers are also natural gas customers. The early phases of, of pays is really going to, and all the literature in this bared it out with, with Lorraine's um, you know, presentation, is that it really, for the most cost-effective scenarios, it's, it's really being played out with electric space heating customers. Uh, Co-delivery has since, you know, evened out that playing field. Wrong way. By segment, you can see the breakdown as follows. So whole building potential uh, is significant from the market potential study at that single family electric and multifamily electric. Um, and it obviously gets much more, you know, difficult moving forward if that house is secure uh, and whether or not the issue of copay plays a part in that or not. Uh, and again, this is to be expected. This is a very conservative program. The 80-20 is, is designed to make sure that those savings actually materialize. Again, breakdown by copay, um, moving forward, estimated savings are considerable. Roughly 304,000 you know, of, of the qualifying customers, uh, or well over 90% of, of the customers you know, within that 0% uh, copay uh, looking at significant annual average savings. Important, and I don't want to stress too much on this. I, I think the RMI discussions got a little uh, off kilter with you know the task at hand, but the issue of of this being an attractive option for low income customers, for low income renters in particular. Um, I think this graph does a really good job of, of showing where the sweet spot is and not, you know, for particular customers. Um, the GDS study makes a point of saying effectively that target population right here, anything below that is effectively a, a more appealing number, whereas anything above this uh, is going to be more attractive to, for example, Evergy's uh, Casey Lilac program. Uh, low income weatherization and so forth. Importantly, what the study did say moving forward is that 17% of the forecasted sales in the residential sector and 8% of the sales in the low income sector encompass the long term pays potential. Those are significant savings uh, for a program to, to, to capture. Uh, and especially when you consider that this study is looking at as a standalone entity, Ameren by itself. Of course, some of these savings probably represent part of what is captured in RAP um, and the incremental potential that addresses financing constraints and increases the total willingness of participants uh, to participate of customers. Homes with a high energy burden, but not excessive, are the best candidates for pays because of the availability of financing to help overcome financial barriers to participate. Again, you know, not to keep, you know, beat this 
you know, to death, but uh, there, there's a donut hole, uh, you know, effectively that is appealing for participants in this. Um, and those on one side of it, uh, there, if we'll put it stated differently, if there's uh, an option for free weatherization, that should always be, you know, the first move as opposed to paying the 3% interest on something. Importantly, one of the things that was brought up in the GDS study was the issue of replace on failure discussion. And we've had this discussion a, a couple of times with stakeholders. To quote the study, another topic to consider going forward that was not a focus of this study is leveraging of an on-bill financing model to cover the cost of HVAC equipment in a replace on fail scenario. In that scenario, the customer is looking to replace a failed unit. The customer will purchase an HVAC, HVAC measure of some efficiency level, regardless of a program intervention. Thus, the program intervention helps move the customer to an incrementally more efficient unit. This is a huge situation, uh, and I don't, I'm preaching to the choir here, but something like more than 75% of all HVAC replacements are because of failure. Basically, people are not looking to replace their HVAC until it's no longer operational. And every time that those HVACs go down, you're effectively missing an opportunity to move a customer to a more efficient unit. Now, this runs in contrast to how we have historically looked at EM and V and savings. As the GDS report points out, it creates an example, while the customers would finance the full measure cost, a standard analysis would only consider the incremental cost and the incremental savings relative to the but-for baseline. Whether or not this replacement on failure becomes part of the, the pays discussion is something that I'd like to tee up for discussion. Um, quite frankly, you know, if there's an opportunity to really move to energy star efficient HVACs at a level, as opposed to the baseline level, uh, the pays model would seemingly provide a real appropriate venue to do that. Uh, that's a game changer for each one of your MIA portfolios, but there's a give and take there. Um, in contrast, and this is just to say how things operate today, uh, effectively the savings are too small to satisfy the terms of the pay program, uh, pays program if done by itself. So what's happening here? What you have is a number of, of customers that are leaving savings on the table. They're, instead of doing the PACE program, instead of doing a home audit, uh, they are looking to get a baseline HVAC unit in place after failure. And we talked a little bit about this in, in terms of the fast pass concept. Moving forward, what did we learn from the RM insight, RMI insight? For myself, probably the most illuminating thing was the program administrator two by two matrix. Today, Amrit, Evergy, Spire, and soon to be Liberty all operate in this utility service provider model, where each individual utility is moving forward with their own siloed program. It has moved somewhat into a governing board model insofar as that we've got co-delivery because of Spire. And again, a credit to Spire in being able to go ahead and, and work with not one, but but all of the electric utilities and trying to manage that. The decentralized model would, would take that a, a step further um, and include, you know, issues like branding across the state um, in a different, in a different governing model entirely. Moving up, other options include having a state agency take control of the program or a third party nonprofit. Uh, we're going to discuss in these in a little bit more detail. And this is uh, where we got some insight from AC Tripoli. So, risk for pays at scale. Um, moving outside of that individual siloed model, what are the risks? Uh, I think the most obvious one is just billing and cost allocation. 
uh, if there was to be a statewide pays model, it would still have to go through an Ameren bill, an Evergy bill, a Spire bill. And I rightly would understand any utility being concerned about, you know, what is what costs are actually being portrayed on their bill. Um, there would be a degree of program control that would be surrendered potentially uh, by each utility. Potentially time consuming legislative or regulatory changes and quite frankly, the cost could outweigh the benefits. Uh, if the numbers don't materialize, this could really be an exercise in madness. However, the opportunities are potentially appealing. Economies of scale and marketing program administration, trade ally outreach and collective bidding. Those are all costs that could collectively bring measures into households at a much, much more, more cost effective manner. Opportunity for outside capital to support the program. Last year, we had um, uh, the Department of Energy, US Department of Energy provide uh, a presentation on outside capital uh, financing uh, and effectively you know, laid out as, as Missouri being a candidate for outside capital. This would be appealing for all parties concerned. Uh, utilities get to, you know, free up their own capital and move that towards projects um, in their PISA or generation mix. Also at scale, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, it would make things easier on our end and the PSC's end. Right now, uh, a lot of duplicative programs and oversight um, just requires lots and lots of bureaucratic paperwork. Uh, the opportunity for increased participants um, moving forward, the idea is that this could even be expanded to include uh, cooperative and municipal utilities. And all of this would result in a decrease in cost, shared expenses with significant energy and demand savings. So let's look at the different models. The advantages of a utility administrative program uh, historically have just been what we do today is that they're well recognized and generally trusted by customers. That they provide a direct and routine customer contact with established relationships. That the organization is structured to serve a large number of customers and manage necessary resources. The potentially good fit for energy services that would include customer energy efficiency and which can clearly fit a utility business model shareholder incentives are aligned with energy savings objectives and customer outcomes, or effectively what we know today as MIA. Utilities definitely benefit from having the direct, easy access to customer accounts. One of the big selling points of pays is that utilities should be able to uh, cherry pick which customers are most likely to benefit from a pays program based off their historical usage. Utilities also have generally in-house experts and are part of a well-established market, meaning that it can be much more stable uh, and less political than non-utility structures. The advantages of a non-utility administration include, generally have a single purpose organizational objective, save energy. Statewide programs can yield greater consistency and better coordination. Statewide programs provide better economies of scale of marketing and relationships with key stakeholders and market actors. Non-utility administration eliminates the potential for internal business conflicts, uh, i.e., how can a, uh, a utility promote both um, energy efficiency measures and uh, energy you know, load programs where you're increasing consumption. This effectively takes it out of the hands of that inherent conflict. Non-utility program administrators can become trusted independent authority. There's no mixed motives. We're here to save you, serve you and save you energy, period. So demand side management administered program designs. This is a inherent, this is a old map. Uh, I believe it's from 2011. So some of these states have changed. But the large dark blue patterns that you see are effectively states in which uh, utilities administer their own programs. States that are colored 
uh, either with stripes or green uh, includes some form of non utility administration. The most notable include the following, uh, and they vary. I'm not going to read each one for you, but they vary in uh, scope and intensity. Uh, Efficiency Vermont, New York Energy Smart Program, Energy Trust of Oregon, and so on. We're going to be discussing some of these. Uh, in fact, most of these are, are nonprofit models. Uh, some involve a, a governing board. Uh, and in some cases, you actually have uh, the state energy office uh, entrusted with it. So disadvantages to a third party. It takes time to build the infrastructure. You can't create new organizations and corresponding capabilities to administer and implement programs overnight. This is a slow process. And I think um, even at the utility side, um, the three PowerPoints that we saw before this bear that out. Changes in contractors can be disruptive. Customer data and account information may not be readily accessible and available. And structure and funding can be less stable and more subject to the political winds. First example I'd like to show you is the Oregon Energy Trust, the Energy Trust of Oregon. Um, it's a nonprofit independent uh, agency that's funded by four separate utilities in the state of Oregon and encompasses about 75% of the entire customer base of the state. It's governed by a volunteer board of directors with three advisory councils. And it's overseen by the, the PSC in Oregon. Um, most recently, um, the funding of it, it comes from a surcharge called the public purpose charge, uh, which is created by statute. That's historically been 3% of the utility revenues, but it's changed to uh, 1.5 in 2021. Efficiency Vermont uh, is a third party nonprofit model. Uh, and it's operated by the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. It's also regulated by the state's PUC. Again, it's primarily funded through a ratepayer surcharge, although they also obtain additional funds through the ISO New England Forward Capacity Market as a, as a green, as an energy resource that's largely on the demand response side. And they receive funding through uh, REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Init Initiative that goes towards thermal efficiency programs. Efficiency Maine Trust uh, operates in very much the same fashion as uh, Vermont, um, insofar as where they get their funding sources from. Uh, it's unique in that it does incorporate a governing board of trustees. Uh, and those are actually appointed by the governor and overseen by the Maine uh, PUC. In Hawaii, uh, Hawaii transition from a utility run program to a state wide third party administer program in 2009. Hawaii's programs have been around since the 1990s uh, prior to that. So it's roughly 20 years of state run or utility run programs. Uh, it includes uh, the HECO utilities, which is Hawaiian Electric, Maui Electric, and Hawaii Electric Light, uh, as well as uh, the uh, cooperative uh, electric company in Hawaii. This was a result of an energy efficiency uh, resource standard and uh, that was implemented in 2009. So effectively, um, the state required a certain number of savings that needed to be, to be met. Going a little bit more into Hawaii, um, the challenges that, that those utilities faced uh, and customers faced is that was the highest, some of the highest electric rates in the, in the country. Um, the legislative changes I mentioned before created a public benefits fund. It also decoupled uh, demand side management programs from rate proceedings. So as a combination of the renewable uh, standards and the renewable energy standards, um, overall categorical change in how uh, electric utilities were operating and offering these programs. It was mirrored through uh, by a, a PSC order uh, that detailed concerns of the inherent conflict between utility objectives to sell more electricity as a means of increasing profit and the DSM goal of encouraging customers to use less electricity. 
the order went on to emphasize long life measures, a reduced emphasis on CFLs, an increased role of community sponsorship, an increased focus on geographic equity, and transitioning from an ex post multi year evaluation to an ex ante estimate with full annual verification, uh, a formative analysis, and a market assessment. Included in the initial RFP to attract uh, vendors uh, to the program included uh, set up scoring criteria comparing relative cost and impacts as well as bidder experience and track records. Program included a 4 year contract uh, was based off the total resource cost test. With an emphasis on maximizing electric and peak demand savings. And broad participation across customers with an emphasis on overcoming market. Barriers and transforming end use markets. Uh, notably, the performance incentive was also capped for this um, program. What were the first year results? Well, it was simplified effectively. We had four residential programs and three commercial programs. And the EM and V largely stayed the same. Um, Notable differences in 2010 was a comparison of accomplishment of program potential was removed and uh, non participant emphasis uh, was taken off of from telephone surveys. In its place was an increase in focus groups and economic effects of energy efficiency. And this relates back to that equity um, initiative that was put forward. So, four utilities went from having their individual siloed programs to all of the utilities offering these same seven programs across the board. And the results were largely impressive. Um, and I don't have the 2010 results. I put up the wrong one. I apologize for that. I'll have to redo that. All right. Mass save. I don't know if you probably can't make that out with a black background, but this is a Massachusetts program. Uh, it's a decentralized uh, state program. Mass Save uh, was preceded prior to Mass Save's existence. There were 25 years of electric and 15 years of, of gas demand side management programs in Massachusetts. And if you know anything about ACEEE scores, you'll know that Massachusetts is either number one or number two of ACEEE best ranked uh, states. Uh, it's usually Massachusetts or California every other every year. Uh, in 2008, uh, the Green Communities Act was passed to go ahead and capture economies of scale and minimize customer confusion and maximize cost effectiveness. What MassSave is, is a brand. So each of the utilities that are under this umbrella brand are still administering their, administering their programs like usual but there are cost savings coming from uniformity in marketing, in outreach, in um, evaluations across the board that are savings passed on to customers, as well as collective bidding on, on measures themselves. You know, as, you know, the question I had asked Brian File earlier today was uh, related to whether or not there were any issues with uh, specific measures um, and uh, inflation, and I think Brian's, you know, response, you know, was that the that e utility had noticed, you know, considerable variation across the subregions in Missouri, uh, in Massachusetts, for example. What what you've got is um, collective bidding across that state, which allows for for cheaper measures. So in MassSave, uh, it's sponsored by each utility. It's supported by the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources and an Energy Efficiency Advisory Council. It synchronizes program offerings, delivery models, application forms, and marketing plans. It's made up of 11 voting members with representatives from ratepayers, large commercial, low income, labor, energy efficiency experts, the environmental community, and from uh, specific um, state government agencies. Those are all voting members of Mass Save. And 13 non-voting members, which include the various program administrators from each of the utilities, uh, their contractors, and uh, the municipal aggregators. Open transparent monthly meetings. 
uh, the EEAC, the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, hires a technical consultant to work through program level analysis and review. The program administrators focus on achieving individual goals with each utility. And the model looks something like this. Individual stakeholders, program administrators, ratepayer, policy, all of this effectively makes that Energy Efficiency Advisory Council works with a council consultant and passes that off to the program administrators as they manage both project goals uh, moving forward. What you have is uniformity in bidding. What you have is uniformity in marketing, um, shared responsibility and evaluation. Importantly, this has huge advantages for um, any sort of economies of scale is really going to help smaller utilities. Uh, this is in, in, in Missouri, this would definitely help you know, customers like uh, rate payers in, in Liberty, um, in Liberty rate payers, as well as municipal and cooperative customers as well. So successes and challenges. Uh, success included uh, cost savings through the residential home energy service audit. And the creation of a technical assessment committee, uh, shared staffing and resources, and considerable savings from commercial upstream lighting. Challenges in the initial phrase it did include branding and getting a consistent you know, message across. Uh, the consistency of systems and data. Uh, this is obviously going to be any challenge in, in a statewide program and a need to content to set concrete baselines from which to measure success. So discussion, is there a path forward away from the utility service provider model? Uh, sitting here today, I, I think there is, and I, I think there is definitely worth having a discussion about this. Let me go ahead and I'll, I'll finish up the PowerPoint before we open this up to discussion, given our time. I'd like to propose that the hypothetical, remember the, we'll go through each of these four options here of what that might look like in a Missouri model. So the hypothetical state agency model, this would be having something like the division of, Ener of energy oversee a program. Um, Importantly, what I'd like to, to suggest here is that the mass save model looked at programs across the board for each of the utilities. It was consolidating each of the utilities into specific programs that were universal across the state of Massachusetts for cooperatives, for municipals, for investor owned. Whether or not we get to that level of Missouri, I don't think this, I don't think we're at that dialogue at this point, but looking at this as a pilot project or something just from a pays perspective makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, yeah, under a state agency model that would most definitely require some sort of legislative change to provide certainty and in, in funding and uh, continuity. In that state agency model, uh, the state would work closely with uh, e utility as a consultant or a program advisor. And what I'd recommend is an RFP for program implementers. This would go out to your third party um, uh, groups like uh, various different um, uh, program implementers that you've got out there. From a utility perspective, this is just cutting a check and earning a return based off the potential and the outcomes. Uh, it's fairly straightforward and would take a lot of the power outside of the utilities in terms of control. On the flip side, it would take a lot of that responsibility and uh, pressure away. The, the funding stream, perhaps the most attractive thing under the statewide model uh, would be a clear cut and um, connection between funding from potential outside sources, namely the federal government, uh, and it can complement existing activities that exist. So if you know anything about um, Missouri Division of Energy, they are effectively a check writing agency. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of money that comes down from the federal government and are, is expected to come down here over the next couple of years. Uh, so this would be a way to leverage those funds. 
Importantly, there would still be PSC oversight in terms of regulatory approval and cost allocation. The third party model represents a departure from that state model. In this example, we'd set out an RFP for a third party program administrator. This would be no different than uh, Vermont Efficiency and Maine Efficiency Collaborative, or even um, to a certain extent, the Oregon Trust. You'd have a third party administrator, and that contract could either go through the PSC, which is how it's traditionally done, or through the D Division of Energy. This too would probably require some sort of legislative change, or at least regulatory change to ensure continuity. Again, you'd work with the utility as a consultant and program advisor. Utilities could cut a check and earn a return based on potential and outcomes. Funding streams from federal and government can complement other activities. Um, everything that you could be done under the state energy model, I think, could easily be done under the nonprofit third party model as well, and has been done in other states. And again, PSC oversight in terms of regulatory approval and cost allocation. One option in Missouri would be to still incorporate um, a state agency. In this case, it would most likely be the Environmental Improvement and Energy Resource Authority uh, for federal funding. And I had mentioned before this would require some legislative changes. I think less so. I'll put it that way. And I think the legislative change that you might have to incorporate with something like this would be opening up for a green bank option. Now, I know there had been you know discussions about that in the past. It becomes a lot easier if, if we've got some certainty that federal funds would be coming down. The governing board model is the mass save model. And I got to be honest, at this point, might be the most appealing one to me. Under the governing board model, you're effectively what we're talking about is just rebranding. And instead of rebranding, you know, statewide across all programs like Mass Save, we would be rebranding one program, pays. In this example, I'll, I threw out the, you know, Missouri Show Me Savings program as, as, as an option. An RFP for a program design and governing structure. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, really just hiring a third party to help draft up rules and guidelines and make suggestions. And I feel like this is something that could get off the ground fairly quickly uh, if there was consensus among all parties as to the best way moving forward. You take the current model that's already in place and you work on a statewide brand for uniformity in marketing, trade ally network standards, offerings, collective bidding, and ultimately, if agreed to, a fast pass option. Again, that's untapping that 75% or more market share that is going unrealized today in Missouri. Whether or not you would see need legislative or regulatory changes, um, I think you would need some regulatory changes, uh, but I think all of that is stuff that uh, could lend itself to, to dialogue over the next six months. Keeping in line with the mass save model again, this would have a, a board of directors, both voting and non voting. Uh, and the idea is really that that RFP for a program of design would help flesh out. The to do list for utilities and implementers to look at. Importantly, all 4 models and the governing board model is going to have PSC oversight in terms of regulatory approval. And cost allocation, and again, incorporating the EI ERA for federal funding. So, at the end of the day, subtle but important differences between each of those three models. So, discussion on models, um, utility-led pays, governing board pays, state agency pays, third-party pays. Uh, we'll see this up here in a second. Outstanding issues that we should all be aware of, um, timing. Uh, Right now, we're in a lull effectively. I know each 1 of the utilities is, is effectively working on. Uh, their portfolios moving forward, assuming you have. Those portfolios are approved. Or some variation of those portfolios are approved for the 2024. Forward MIA cycles for each of the utilities. 
that gives us a year and a half to map out or have a, a firm discussion as to whether or not this is an option. Um, and recognize that there's a give and take here. Uh, when I ring up the uh, replacement on failure option, uh, that's a huge give if we were to give it up from OPC's perspective, because um, that becomes a free rider issue and that becomes an issue of, you know, well, how much cost savings should be appropriate, appropriate allocated to the utilities as a result of that. The only scenario where I see that as an option is if um, we have some alignment, some agreement on, on a fast pass and statewide model that brings down the overall cost. Is consensus possible? Uh, well, I guess we're going to find out. Uh, and, you know, the goal with, with today's presentation, you know, and I don't want to put people on the spot uh, if they're not comfortable with, with having a lot of dialogue about this. Uh, but uh, definitely, if, if you do have thoughts, to, to raise them now. Absent that, um, and following today's conversation, We'll be reaching out to each of the utilities and stakeholders moving forward uh, to see if there is some consensus moving forward on this uh, or, you know, keeping in mind with the opportunity cost slide that, that I put out at the very beginning. Uh, there's only a finite amount of time and energy and money. Uh, if this isn't worth going down or, or, or pursuing, then we need to cut our losses and move on to something else. So next steps, as I would propose, is for August and September uh, to solicit uh, some affirmation one way or the other from utilities. Uh, in how this would go about would be actually teeing up uh, a description uh, that would be laid out for, uh, for each of the stakeholders for input in a follow-up conversation. If we were to move forward, you know, we'd discuss whether or not there would need to be some legislative or regulatory changes, depending on the model that we move forward with, uh, and then meet up again with actionable items in September and October. Uh, and then again, part of this discussion, I think, I think it's definitely worth having is, is that discussion about replace on failure. Uh, if I'm a utility, that alone should, should bring me to the table as part of the discussion. If you want to achieve meaningful savings on the energy efficiency side moving forward over these next couple of years, as you know, we're looking at least cost resource planning and moving away from lighting, residential lighting, there needs to be deeper savings. So how do you achieve that? So I'll leave you with this note of herding cats and value proposition. For utilities, what would you be offering is some certainty. For regulators, efficiency. For consumers, cost savings. For environmentalists, clean energy. State Energy Office, uh, a fulfilling of, of their state mission uh, objectives. This is also known as a win-win-win situation. All right, it's that rare combination that's rarely seen in regulatory proceedings. It's elusive. Might be able to capture it. Questions? Okay. Hey, Jeff, uh, thanks for the presentation here. This is Philip with Renew Missouri. I just wanted to lift up that DE is working on an infrastructure bank and there might be an opportunity for coordination if we're having a statewide model for pays and looking at using that for some financing options. Uh, could you provide a little bit more color on that, Philip? Um, so, like working on a statewide energy infrastructure bank, is that something that um, does it have a deliverable date in mind or an operational date where that would be open? I can't speak to that, but Jordan or Marty, can either of you, you know, talk about that a little further from your end? Hi, folks, can you hear me okay? This is Jordan. Yes, we can hear you, Jordan. Hey, super. Um, so we've been working with EIERA and right now we're just at the point of having a, uh, a, a, a memo of understanding between the two of us that we'd like to explore this together. Um, you know, we are still working on the details and, you know, how this might come together, but we don't have anything that's official yet. Um, we're just exploring the idea internally at the moment. 
Okay. Um, we'll take it. We'll take it. Sounds sounds promising. With this, I mean, to the extent that you guys have this conversation, um, you know, I'd recommend that you at least you know throw out the the option of whether or not um, a statewide pays program would complement, and I think it would that infrastructure bank. Uh, but that might be worth having another discussion here in the near future. I agree. Uh, I'm going to go around and uh, I'm just going to call out um, stakeholders here about, you know, thoughts uh, one way or the other about what's been presented. Uh, and if, if people do have a strong feeling one way or the other to, to please say it now um, so we can minimize these. These conversations to the extent possible. Um, Lorraine, Jeff, I'm going to pick on you guys first since uh, you guys are Amron. Uh, I, I think the one thing we've talked about in the past is how does this fit in with MIA, with you know each utility having an earnings opportunity, a throughput disincentive. Um, I, I think that's always going to be our main concern there. Um, as you probably know, I've been involved in a lot of discussions on early replacement and replace on fail. So, looking forward to having even more conversations on that because I, I do think. Um, yeah, I think there is sort of a disconnect on that side of it for pays. Um, I, I think maybe if a customer is replacing their system right at failure, then maybe the current model works because the customer still sees that the big savings compared to their old system that just failed. If, if you have a customer whose system failed two or three years ago, then that's when that throws off that model. Right. Well, I was actually thinking of you uh, when when I was writing this um, early this morning. So um, I, I appreciate that, and it, it has not been lost on. Um, I agree. Like each one of those models would need to fit in with with your MIA objectives. Um, all right, points points taken. Uh, Brian or Natalie from uh, Evergy. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Jeff. I um, appreciate the presentation and uh, walking through a little bit more of your thought process there. Uh, definitely have some familiarity with some of the other state models, not directly, but indirectly through the various uh, you know, associations and, and industry activities that we get involved in. So thanks for providing a little more clarity and color and how you think that you know, could be discussed here. Um, Generally speaking, I think, you know, maybe some of the technical details are interesting to us as well that Lorraine just hit on uh, related to the replace on fail question. I, I still don't have my mind wrapped around the math of how that works with the incremental or not and the 80 20, but that may just be somebody educate me a little bit on, on how that works. So that's, I think, uh, if that's a separate session we get into, I think that would be interesting for us. Um, gen generally, though, back to kind of the model perspective, I think, you know, Mia and how the interaction there plays is is important for us as well. So I'll, I'll reiterate that point. Uh, and, and I think you made a good point, Jeff, in your slides, right? I mean, the transition of of us, if, if this were to be administered, you know, as a third party or a different organization, and then ultimately it. Uh, is put on uh, our customer's bill uh, and that and that connection is very important to us to understand and have oversight and make sure we're well in tune with what it is and what it, you know, customers interaction with that uh, tariff on their bill. You know, obviously it's, we do it today, but as the third party part, that's a little bit of, you know, again, just transition. I don't, not that I don't think it can be overcome. I think that's just something that you know, sticks out in my mind is something to, to think a little bit about. I think um, it's, valid. It, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. sorry, the last thing I'll say is just, you know, I think we're really finding out also what is the real market potential and the sweet spot of customers here, right? I, I do agree with your points about, obviously, the part of the intent to here is efficiency across the state and, and the uh, scale value. Uh, I'm still not uh, fully, grasping on, again, this 
the right sweet spot for this customer base, you know, that doesn't have a copay, which makes it most cost effective for them. And, you know, is in the right home situation that doesn't have others health and safety issues or whatever, right? It, it gets a little bit, in my opinion, uh, kind of detailed and weedy that probably needs to be worked through. Again, I know there's at least one potential study out there, but that's something that I think uh, consideration for the bigger group, right? Is, you know, how big effort to put is how big the market is, right? And, and who are we targeting for sure? No, I think those are, those are very valid points. Um, let me speak just just a, a, a bit, my, my thoughts, my knee-jerk thoughts on, on some of what you said. I mean, the 80-20 incremental um, and the replace on fail and how that how that math plays out. From, from my vantage point, so much of that is dependent on the cost of this overall program coming down as a result of economies of scale. So cost decreases in marketing and program delivery in uh, being able to collectively bid on measures uh, at, at a lower scale and aligning trade allies with that. Uh, if, and then also I'm operating under the assumption, you know, like, like I said before, that we are just living in a world where everything is just getting more expensive. Uh, so the idea that, you know, electric, your electric bill is going to be increasing. Your gas bill is going to be increasing because of increased infrastructure, you know, uh, and and capex investments is is not something that uh, is going to should surprise anybody at this point. Uh, so the combination of those things, you know, should result in in more cost effective programs moving forward, in theory. Uh, in, in as far as um, the billing issues concerns, uh, I've got the same same concerns. The only thing that gives me comfort is like clearly it happens in Vermont and Wisconsin and Delaware and Oregon. Um, so I, I don't think it's insurmountable. I, I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, but uh, clearly other states and, and utilities have, have done that third party model before. Uh, but the health and safety issue is, is a very real one uh, and one that will I think always be present in, in some form or another uh, in, in being able to hit this stuff. You know, there's only so much that, you know, these programs can do, right? Well, thanks for the insight. Uh, Nate, Hackney, Greg, any initial thoughts? I know you guys haven't had the opportunity to, to roll out your PACE program yet, but uh, you've been knee deep in, in a lot of these discussions for, for quite a while now. Hey, sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. And, and, uh, yes, qualifying all that. Uh, I, I probably ought to put it on record. It goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We have the same concerns about compatibility with Mia and, and all the, the, you know, full cost recovery, uh, built into that. Um, I'll also footnote, um, for what it's worth. She's not on the call today. Uh, Kim is, you know, our manager over the East and West, or excuse me, East and, and central regions. Um, and, uh, we are a party to mass saves. We're, we're part of, we're part of mass saves and involved in that uh, daily and, and deeply. I am not, um, it's, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of work in saw sharpening, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, if and when conversations progress to that level, we'll have um, hopefully some some additional insights as a as a member of Mass Saves. Um, but uh, yeah, basically echo all the uh, concerns and all of the uh, qualified optimism of uh, of our fear IOUs. There, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, I, I think Kim um, is is quite an asset in, in having worked in Mass Save quite a bit. Um, you know, I, you know, full disclosure. A couple of weeks ago, I was definitely leaning towards a, a third party nonprofit model and I've. Definitely come much more around to the, the governing board model. I think it makes. It makes a lot of sense and uh, probably is the path of least resistance in terms of achieving a lot of the goals. That are, are easily attainable, I think, at, at the end of the day. Um, Shailen, you and the Spire team. Uh, who's clearly a, a pivotal part in this PACE program. Uh, any, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, and I think I'll end up going back through this, Jeff, and having you send out your presentation too. But I, I think for us, one, you know, 
we don't have a Mia, right? So um, really, really thinking through this process statewide, what it looks like for us. Um, some other things I think about on your last point, as far as the governing body, I, at first, I think you and I had talked and, you know, not that I wasn't somewhat open to that piece, but how does that work, right? Where everybody's voice is really heard there from, you know, a utility perspective, because we run into different things all the time statewide. Um, but I think for us, I mean, we want to try to make some things work and, and, and really work through some things. Uh, but it sounded like a lot in your presentation that, um, so, you're, you're seeing e utility and maybe this is something you just haven't chatted with them about yet. Right? But you see them more in a consulting role. If you know, pretty much with almost all these steps for the most part, right? It's a good, it's a good question and sort of it, it's. Again, I'm speaking for myself here. I see. E utility as essential. For a variety of reasons. But probably most because of the trademark. All right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the pays model, there's a lot of different models out there. Uh, we went with the pays model because we felt like it was the most, it made the most sense for consumers and stop. Um, it might not, you know, result in, you know, the most measures being changed uh, right off the bat, but that's because it's designed to ensure that you're getting those savings. So I think it minimizes the opportunity for bad actors to take advantage of customers. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's really, really, really important from, from our office's standpoint, uh, because, you know, we don't need to be on, you know, the John Oliver show. All right. Yeah. And, and yeah. being played out there. Uh, no, I, I get where you're going there. And I guess my biggest thing is really just understanding the, you know, if that is the case, right, utility and all these other pieces, right, really how that, that works. And again, I come back to Spire, you know, everyone else on here does have Mia and there are certain protections and things in place. We would really have to understand from some of your regulatory discussions, right, what that truly looks like from a, a gas perspective, especially with other changes and, and when we talk about other federal money coming in. So we would just have to have real conversations, Jeff, to kind of, you know, which I think we're trying to do here, but really taking a, a deep dive look at some of this. But I, but I think as, as you know, Spire is always open to uh, being collaborative and trying to figure out what, what kind of works best as from, especially from a statewide approach. Thanks, Jalen. Makes a lot of sense. And just to, to answer your question where I really see utility in this, like, it, it, again, this is just Jeff talking, but I, I see utility as more of the advisor, um, sort of, you know, um, quality control manager. It may, may be like a better uh, qualifier for this. Um, and that there are third party implementers putting out that program, doing the audits and moving forward with that. And then e utilities defense effectively making sure that those programs are being run well. And, and, and monitored or in adhering to that pays formula. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not married to anything I've said today. I'll, I'll, I'll put that out there. Uh, this is meant to, to elicit discussion and thought and, you know, we will, you know, be pushing, you know, actors to, to have opinions on this one way or the other moving forward. So thanks. Thanks. Uh, renew Missouri. Um, James, do you get any thoughts on this? Looks like James might have fallen off. Okay. Um, Philip, do you want to weigh in at all? Yeah, I don't really have anything more to add. Um, just we want to keep following this and you know, really appreciate everything that everyone has uh, talked about here in the PACE program. And I guess really we would just like to see it adopted in more places in the state. Um, and we'd really like to see an example of a co-op taking it up when they have such a great financing opportunity in front of them and offering a program to their member owners. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I think if you were to have a statewide program in some form or fashion, uh, the cooperatives and municipals would follow suit. Um, I think it, 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 this is a case where if you build it, they'll come. Uh, moving forward. 
we've got a lot on our plate here over the next year, uh, not just with pays, but obviously different regulatory filings uh, that are you know set to, to occur in discussions. Uh, I we you know would encourage each of the utilities to to keep up the dialogue with with regulators and advocates. Um, I think uh, that's you know the path of least resistance is just keeping it an open, honest, and uh, dialogue moving forward. Um, probably you know one of the more pertinent issues moving forward is also that of uh, demand response uh, and demand response measures. As um, if you've been watching the news at all in terms of reliability issues and and, and potential you know concerns over you know blackouts. Uh, Shailen, uh, I see your hand up. Uh, some insight. Yeah. Yeah, so can you, I mean, since we have staff on here too, can, I mean, would anyone from staff like to talk about anything they've heard today, Jeff? Yeah, I, I should probably, I should probably put Brad on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Shayla. No, I was actually uh, thinking about putting myself on the spot anyway. I, I don't really have a lot to add. Um, I would say I, I, I truly appreciate the discussion. Uh, I think it was good. I think it's important. Um, I completely understand all of the, uh, you know, sort of concerns or, or questions that utilities have going forward. Cause I think, you know, myself and, and probably Jeff included, that's, that's why we're having these conversations to see if we can't come up with an answer. Um, and I, I definitely don't know what that is. So I appreciate the discussion. Um, and I'd probably just echo what, what I think we've said in the past that, you know, staff definitely uh will continue to support pays programs you know as long as they're you know seem reasonable structured appropriately uh, again that's very broad in general um but i think these these conversations are helping us understand what what that is and and um i'd like to think making progress you know we've, we've obviously got the pays programs for for most um almost all you know utilities um are the stakeholders on the call here anyway? So if we can figure out how to collaborate and come up with uh, a way to get, you know, something more um, collective in place, um, we're definitely uh, we'll be along for the ride. Hey Brad, this is Keevil. Let me jump in here just real quick and say that in, in terms of Jeff, Jeff Mark, uh, you had the, on your last slide the, the the herding the cats analogy, which I think is very apropos here but i noticed under the uh, regulatory or regulators you had the uh, benefit being efficiency and it always scares me when when people talk about we're, we're going to increase the efficiency uh because it seems like every time that we've added in the past here recently we, we like the when the utilities have gone in for legislative changes or regulatory changes it seems to have had the opposite effect, uh, even though it was touted as improving efficiencies. Uh, whenever you get the additional line items on the uh, customer bills, they, they, they somehow don't, the efficiencies don't pan out, but you wind up with additional cases to address the, uh, so it, it seems like here you, I'm not exactly sure how you'd, uh, whether you would address the, line items on the utility bills and the utility rate cases or whether you do it some some other some other way but i noticed you had uh, possibility or, or likelihood of regulatory and or legislative changes would be necessary under all four of your different models uh which you're probably right but going back to what i said that always scares me whenever i see uh, reg changes in the legislature or rules to increase efficiency it just normally doesn't work that way it's been my experience but i certainly hope uh i i hope you're right let me say it that way it sounds it sounded good i guess the uh, proof is always in the uh, pudding so to speak words of wisdom mr keeble um words of wisdom uh that is not lost on us uh, and you know, I, I think this this needs to make sense for all stakeholders for it to move forward. So, um, thank you.
anybody else uh, want to weigh in while we have an opportunity here? Jeff, I kind of want to be talking next steps, just statewide. Sure. Yes. So if there's no, this is Brad with staff. So if there's no other questions pertaining to, to the topic at hand here, I'd like to kind of maybe end with a little discussion on next steps going forward in the statewide collaborative process. So this is uh, first one that we've had this year. Per the rule, rule we're required to have them semi-annually. Um, that rule also uh, places quite a bit of of the uh, um, those requirements and, and initiating. Um, there's a number of things that, that staff are required required to do through the through the rules and. Um, I think that's there's charter language in there. We current we have a charter that, that kind of details some of the requirements of staff. Um, I just want to say that you know when we have statewide collaboratives like like the one we had today, uh, I, I think it's great. You know when we actually have a pressing topic, um, but I will say selfishly that it's also great, um, and I appreciate Jeff for. Kind of just taking the lead on this and running with it. Um, it, it definitely was was a relief for for staff. So um, so going forward, um, and the requirement of having another one this year still. Um, I don't know if there's any thoughts on if there's any real pressing topics. I don't know if we can incorporate maybe another a follow up statewide. On pays, Jeff, I know you had some an August September date. I don't know exactly what that would uh, consist of. If that would even fit fit into a follow up like this, probably not. I mean, honestly, I, the, the August September follow up is probably me contacting you guys individually, um, in in getting some feedback in write up and then sharing it with the group. Um, depending on how that plays out, um, we'd probably have a collaborative, but it probably, you know, I mean, this this is. This isn't a bridge statewide collaborative anyway, right? Sure. We're, we're not going the, the, the full um, slot, you know, due to uh, timing changes, uh, but um, yeah, I guess TBD. Well, well, and I think it's, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the reasons I bring this up is because, you know, absent, absent sort of a, a, an abridged um, collaborative, and then this is just my opinion, it seems as though some of the collaboratives we've had in the past, it, it almost seems as though sometimes we're having them just to have them. We are, you know, sort of struggling to find topics to discuss and it's just kind of piecemealed and uh, for lack of a better word, just kind of half assed. And um, I don't think that's that, that's not efficient and beneficial for anybody's time. Uh, so a couple things to just kind of leave everybody with. Um, one, um, you know, with, with just the workload, you know, that, that sort of seems to have become the norm and the new standard with all of the filings, um, these, these sort of, this, this collaborative just is not a, typically at the forefront of, of our priorities. So if, you know, I would challenge everybody, one, to think of topics, you know, pressing topics that uh, are, are useful and beneficial to everybody. Two, I would also, uh, appreciate if if anybody would uh, you know offer to step up and and take on you know some of the roles or responsibilities that, that uh, for whatever reason staff you know kind of got left with and required to do three if uh, none of the else applies none of the above applies um, we would be open to filing a a variance to the rule to not have this collaborative if we don't have pressing topics or, or topics of interest um, that all stakeholders can can agree on to be, you know, a useful way to spend time. So, so just some things to to think on. It's a collaborative, so you know, I, th I think it's important that you know if, if stakeholders want to put forward something, you know, this is a forum for you to do it. Absent that, then not much of a need for the forum. Or the charter, <clears throat> technically, at this stage, we would pick 
what group or oh, who would do it next? Utility would hold it next, and then tentative dates is how that's listed in the charter. <clears throat> that's so that's kind of usually at the end of the <clears throat> the end of the meetings. Yep. I can't talk for some reason. So so there are rule and charter requirements. Um, I don't know that we necessarily have to put anybody on the spot or try and force anybody into um, a role um, that, that, that they don't necessarily want. But uh, um, yeah, just be cognizant of, of that. And like I said, we're required to have one by the end of the year. If it doesn't seem necessary to have one, I think there's measures to be taken to not have one. So. So I guess, you know, Brad, this is Kevin. Let me just piggyback on what you said there. I, I think what you're looking at, it would be both a combination of potential variance to the rule as well as potential amendment to the charter, both of which can be done. Uh, both, neither of which are extremely difficult, but they do, they would require the collaborative, I think, to vote, at least to amend the charter would certainly require a collaborative vote on that. Uh, and, and as regarding your, your, like you said, the rule and the charter both currently provide for semi-annual meetings. And if you're having trouble getting, you know, together twice a year, uh, maybe that could be dropped down to once a year, but again, you could could do so through a, a charter amendment and or variance to the uh, to the rule. So I mean, it's it's it's, it's not that hard, but it's just uh, something that you know people need to consider. Yeah, yeah, and I'll piggyback off your piggyback just with one more thing that you know even if we amended the collaborative or the charter. Um, there's nothing that precludes all of us from getting together at any time to discuss any topic that, that seems relevant. Um, it just wouldn't necessarily be a requirement like it is now. That's very true. Yes. All right. Um, anybody else while we've got a forum, anybody else uh, uh, would like to say anything? Jeff, it's Brian. I'll just weigh in on the discussion around the uh, MEAC go forward. I think we're open to various solutions there that were discussed, whether it's moved to once a year or put in as ad hoc to something to that degree. I don't actually remember, even though I'm sure I was involved at some point in time, what the MEAC was originally input into the document for, I mean, on a, on its face, right? Sounds like a good idea. Let's get together and discuss things. But uh, I understand with the actual reality that we've had with everything else going on. And obviously we're, we're reporting to stakeholders every quarter and other kinds of things that we do without not talking. Um, so, you know, again, I'm open to all those different kinds of solutions as we, as we go forward, I guess I would throw that out there. And then something I didn't realize, Brad, until we, Brad and I talked about this a few days ago, uh, is, is how similar the rule and the charter are. Somehow or another, it looks like the the one just wound up in the other. <laughs> so, so it's like I'm not even sure why some of these requirements show up both places, but they do. So that's kind of I I found that somewhat surprising, but. You know, a lot of a lot of that's a product of, of just its time when when those MIA rules were drafted last time around. MIA was very different. I mean, like the everything about it was very different. You know, even the regulatory proceedings and you know the people involved. So uh, we we have definitely evolved over time. So this isn't a, you know the, the fact that you're not having biannual MIA. MIA meetings, you know, on a statewide basis, I don't think is uh, indicative of it not being successful. Um, I agree with Brad. We, people are busy. There's there's a lot going on, and we're, we're spread pretty thin as it is. Um, but you know, if if there are groups out there, uh, particularly you know non-utility groups that have issues that you'd like to to, to discuss or present on, um, you know, this is the forum to do it. So. I'd encourage you to reach out to um, Brad uh, and Corey uh, about presenting because that's what I did. Yep.
Yeah, that, that's how the charter works, right? Okay. So listed specifically as one of the groups. All right, uh, going once, twice. Thank you, everybody, for uh, the 2022 biannual statewide MIA collaborative. Um, I will follow up with individual stakeholders uh, hereafter and uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See y'all. Thanks. Stay, stay cool out there. Yeah. <laughs>